today we have before us one of the most difficult teachings of Jesus. In this text, clear as day, Jesus speaks of an unforgivable sin, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When I came across these verses as a young believer, I'd move on rather quickly to some of Jesus' more comforting words. But turning the page in my Bible didn't make his words go away. Why this passage unnerved me really boiled down to this. How could I reconcile Jesus' warning of an unforgivable sin while also trusting that his sacrifice was a perfect offering for all sin? I had begun to embrace truths that teach we have redemption through his blood, and that brings forgiveness of sin, that in Christ God made us alive and forgave all our sins, and that God removed our sins as far as the East is from the West. But it seemed like I had to choose between two opposing yet seemingly evident attributes of God. Our view of God is the most important thing about us, and forming this view with only a few verses of scriptures taken out of context makes him into something he's not. We need the whole of the scriptures as the foundation through which we can recognize his nature and be led into his presence. What I found in that place was a God whose unchanging nature is mercy, love, and grace, and anything that appeared to contradict that just left something to be discovered. If the God I encountered is the same yesterday, today, and forever, then his nature is and always will be full of mercy, grace, and love. So now let's look at our text with these truths in our hearts. In Matthew 12, a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus and healed. Amazed by what they witnessed, the people said, Can this be the Christ? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It's only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. So there's this dispute on the source of Jesus' power, questioning whether his motives and power were good or evil. What could not be disputed was that Jesus was no ordinary man. He worked miracles in power, and multitudes were eyewitnesses to it. Even the Pharisees had to acknowledge that Jesus' power was not from this world. Agitated and bewildered, the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation, their predicament, they could no longer discredit Jesus as a con man or fraud. If his works were undeniable, then all his claims must be believed, that he had come from God, that he was God, and as the Messiah, it was through his message and work alone that the gift of reconciliation with God was possible. Now, this message was not one the Pharisees could stomach, as it meant everything they worked to accomplish, all their respect, all their influence, and all their power, that it really meant nothing. So what shall we do? They couldn't deny the work, so they attacked its source. Desperate to stop Jesus' growing momentum, they got strategic. They would convince the crowds that his work was the fruit of a poisonous tree. His source was evil, from other gods, from Satan himself, Voiding all his work, past, present, future, in one fell swoop. Now, it's important to understand that this claim, that Jesus' power was not from God, was premeditated and intentional. The intent to discredit his power was from Almighty God, thereby nullifying his ministry and message. A premeditated and intentional rejection of God's message, heart, and power. This was the unforgivable sin Jesus spoke of, vilifying and rejecting the work of God, as in Christ and God alone is forgiveness of sin. Now we see Jesus exposing the thoughts and intents of their hearts. He said, either make the tree good or evil, but the fruit really tells the truth. Let's compare fruit and see whose looks more like Beelzebub. Your own test condemns you. And then amazingly, right after Jesus sternly rebuked the lie that his fruit was evil, the scribes and Pharisees asked Jesus to perform another sign. Why? They just acknowledged this man's power was undeniable. You'd think he'd want to cool it off a bit. But their knockout punch was a breath away. 
Deuteronomy 13 says, If there arises among you a prophet, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, saying, Let us go after other gods, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet, for the Lord your God is testing you, but that prophet shall be put to death. Step one, yeah, this man is one who comes in power, maybe even a prophet, but not of God. He serves other gods, such as Bezalel, Baal, and the like. Step two, Observe him working a bona fide sign or wonder and confirm he calls others after these gods. Step three, our God commands to put this man to death, to put away this evil, giving legal grounds to extinguish him for good. Jesus wouldn't fall for it, not for a second. Now, no longer appearing in the power of one greater than Elisha, he came with a message as one greater than Jonah. As Jonah, a Galilean prophet, sent forth from God, who endured an unimaginable three days and nights in a whale's belly, through which he brought God's message of forgiveness to an undeserving and evil people, should they repent. The sign they needed stood right before them as another Galilean, greater than Jonah, who would endure a more terrible and unimaginable three days and nights, brought God's grace and forgiveness to all who would repent and believe. Through rightly viewing God, we can see our story is not revealing a God whose heart is to condemn. Conversely, we see a God whose nature is filled with second chances, grace, mercy, and truth, offering us rescue even at our worst by disarming and destroying that which separates us from Him. His will is and always will be that none should perish, but all would repent and have eternal life.